Link, mute it on the bottom so there's no echo. Got it. Right. Let's see here. YouTube's a bit slow, so it might take a couple of seconds to get it up going. And da -da -da, here we go. So let me know if you got that now, Gary. I sent you. Should be gone. And there it is. Okay, I'm up. Right. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. So I'll get this up once it's loaded. <coughs> Let me see here. Da -da -da. Right, I need to get out myself. Here we go live all right we got some people in here right bear with us folks um i want to get everything sorted i'm gonna get the link out to myself and then i can get it out to our social media right uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can you see uh, someone, uh, a comment from Alexander Vata? Yep. from Germany. Awesome. There he is. Hello, Alexander. Right, so I know I've, this is like um, a couple of minutes early, guys, but as you know, on these uh, live Q&As, it takes me a couple of minutes to get it out on social media, so bear with me. But uh, yeah, Gary, what time is it over here uh, uh, for you? It must be I'm, 10, I'm 10 o'clock. I'm approaching 1300, 1 p.m. Well, 1 p.m., yeah, yeah. So have you had a good day so far? I've had a, a pretty good day, yeah. I moved into the new house and uh, trying to put together floating shelves, which oh, wow. is a whole frustrating event. <laughs> Especially when one thinks they're a carpenter and they're not. <laughs> Hello, Stephen. How you doing? Hello, Karen. Good to see you guys again. Like just joining us, like it gives me a couple of minutes, and I'll be with you. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're just chatting with Gary at the moment. I, as you can notice, he's got an amazing flight jacket on with some great patches. There it is. That's the squadron, my forty fourth, and that's of course the one that's very special, the Eagle Driver. And of course, for all of you, when you come on board, you F fourteen. You know, turkey pukes, gobble, 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 gobble. Oh, That's don't the start them off, Gary. Right. Don't start them off. Right. Gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> So yeah, like uh, while while I get this done, like um, in the comments, just let me know if you like seeing Gary's like two part interview. Obviously, like it's doing really well, and I put up a it was um, the little clip from Gary's interview last night about the F fifteen going against the F fourteen. Uh, but yeah, let us know if you saw that because it seems to be doing uh, pretty well, and you guys seem to be loving it. And of course, humbly, I won. I mean, humbly, of humbly, course, humbly, of course. because I excel in my humility. I'm told that many times. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing that's a good thing gary hello oh. uh aunt 1980 1980 tell me that was not the year you were born oh god <laughs> i'll be old and the freckle bunny hi there freckle bunny hi freckle bunny how you doing guys Penny, bunny I can't read. That's why I have these glasses on, but I need to have bigger glasses. <laughs> uh, it's getting old. It's getting old, y'all. Yeah, y'all. That's because I'm from Texas, and we say y'all. Oh, so you're originally from Texas, yeah? Oh, yeah. I was I was born in a hospital, which has now been converted. You're going to love this. I can't make it up. And say an asylum. Yes. Nowhere. That, where I have the, my mom showed me the room uh, on a clipping when they decided to switch it over to an insane asylum. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All my friends tell me, of course, that's exactly where you should be born. So, yeah. Wow. They, yeah. They don't, they're mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, as you see, like Gary, I've just got this out on um, uh, social media. 
Uh, but yeah. Oh my gosh, there's a whole whole lot of people now. Yeah, and if you can, yeah, if you remember, Alexander like, Matter, up. hi, got gotcha. you. SDK 4422, and uh, and 1980. It was the year I was born. A vintage year, dude. <laughs> That's when I graduated from college and started pilot training. 1980. Ouch. So we're going to start off this late, like if I can interrupt you there, Gary. I know, like, thanks for uh, everyone for joining us. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get so many more questions, but uh, oh, yeah, but yeah, we will. Uh, but uh, yeah, Gary, can you tell us? I, I, obviously, probably everyone who's joining us has, has watched the interviews, but if you can just briefly tell us about your career, where you started, and what you flew, well, that'd be great, so we can get the questions in. I uh, finished up at Texas A&M. Uh, in 1980, May of 1980, and from there I had to wait a couple months until November of 1980, which is 40 years ago now since we're in November. And I started pilot training in Del Rio, Texas, which is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then a year later I graduate and got to go fly the OV-10. Uh, first you have to go through fighter lead-in, which uh, they take the, since you're already current in the T-38, they take what's called an AT-38. It's got a, a rack underneath it so that you can drop bombs, shoot the gun, all that kind of good stuff. And I, I did a month-long, maybe it's two-month-long, fighter lead-in course. And then from there, I went to uh, Patrick Air Force Base. Uh, that's where they launched uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, all those. Uh, Patrick is the base right next to it where NASA is. And then uh, from there, once I finished uh, OV-10 school, I went over, deployed to my squadron, which was at Simbach Air Base, uh, Germany, which is right, really close to Kaiserslautern, about an hour south of Frankfurt. Uh, got to do that for about two years, and then uh, Congress decommissioned our squadrons, and so we had to bring the OV-10s back, and uh, they decided that the best way to bring them back was to fly them back as opposed to put them on the boat. So we did an uh, 11 day boondoggle, uh, I mean boondoggle, uh, of which I was very <laughs> happy to be part of, got to be one of the flight leads to um, take us across. We went to uh, Macrohanish, Scotland, school, and then uh, from there we went to Keflavik in Iceland, then Saundersham, Greenland, almost the top of the world, and then um, Frobisher Bay, Canada. Man, tell it, there is nothing in Frobisher Bay in July except mosquitoes. And <laughs> just unbelievable. And from there, Goose Bay, and then Goose Bay on to um, the rest of the world. And um, let's see what this is. I just got something declined. Sorry about that. And bound back up. Got some funky phone call. So I finished another year at George Air Force Base in um, California and uh, was awarded an F-15. So from there, I went back to fighter lead in again and then on to Tyndale Air Force Base because that's where all the air-to-air -air F-15s were. They were um, thinking about converting to this new concept of a Mud Eagle uh, ease. So I got to go to Tyndale, which was nice. Uh, so I got to have... Um, uh, water with my beachfront property because that's the uh, the the always we give Arizona a lot of grief because there's always a lot of dirt but there's no beachfront and then from there I got assigned uh, to the 44th Tech Fighter Squadron uh, the Vampires in um, there they are there's the Vampires in um, Okinawa Japan Kadena Air Base and did three years there and that's how I finished up and then got out got in the airlines. Awesome. So, so I think you're going to have a great Q&A uh, tonight, guys, or morning, wherever you are from. But uh, Gary, as you can see, the questions are coming in on the right. Oh, and my gosh. Yeah, if you can remember to scroll up and down. Uh, but I'm going to let you loose. I'll be here. Just shout ah, me if you need me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy, guys, and I hope uh, Gary right. answers your questions. All right, I'll see if I can figure this out. Um, uh, the... Freckle Punny uh, asked, um, how did you uh, tackle, oops, it moved. How did you tackle the an SU-27-30 DACT and did you think the F-15 is equal? It's a very interesting thing. Those airplanes 
weren't around. I mean, they this was like classified stuff that the Russians were starting to build. So we uh, spent most of our time uh, engaging, or not engaging, but learning to defend against MiG-21s, MiG-23s, uh, those type of things. Uh, so I didn't get into that. Uh, it was all super classified. So unfortunately, I would love to say that's what I did, but I didn't. Uh, Heathrow, uh, J.R. Heathrow, how many minimum years did you have to do when you signed up initially for the Air Force? Uh, in the United States, you have to have a four-year college degree. It's pure and simple. Once you have a four-year college degree, then you can get um, an assignment into the Air Force. Uh, let's see. Alexander Vatter, did you uh, ever uh, drop cargo or paratroopers from the oh, Bronco? Dude, dude, that is so cool. No, no, I did not. When I uh, volunteer out at the Fort Worth uh, Museum, Fort Worth Aviation Museum, we have two OV-10s. We have a Marine Corps OV-10 and an Air Force OV-10, which was one of my squadrons. Uh, and the Marine guys got to do that. And you just take off the back end of that thing. It's just the door's just made of fiberglass. And they scoot the paratroopers in there. It's about probably four fully dressed Special Forces guy. And what you do is you fly in real low to the ground. And then when you get to the target area, you could turn on the light to tell them, hey, get ready. We're at the jump zone. But it doesn't matter because you're going to take the airplane and go straight up vertical like this. They're all going to fall out because there's nothing, there's no seat belts, there's nothing there. So they fall out and they do their parachute special forces thing. And I do kind of a hammerhead stall turn, a wing over. And then I go back and E and E my way back to the base and I sleep in a bed and they sleep in the jungle. That, of course they love that jungle stuff. So that's, that's way cool for them. Uh, anyway, uh, that's special forces guys. Um, Elaine Wesley, hi Gary, love the interviews. Thank you, you're very kind. I appreciate that. Uh, then Templar7832. Hi, Gary. Your interviews are awesome. <laughs> You're extremely kind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Love the F-15. Pratt & Whitney. Yeah. Or GE. Uh, you, you know, that's, boy, that, that's like 15s and 16s. That argument's going to go on for eternity. Uh, which airplane's better? By the way, the 15 is better than the F-16, even though the F-16 guys think they're better, but that's okay. You know, that's all right. We just call them targets. That's all they were. Of course, you got to remember, I was flying against the F-16A models, and we own, own the sky against A models, because all you do is get slow. They have an AOA limiter, so that's what, you just get slow with the A models. Um, uh, did you, uh, Alexander Vatter, he asked again, uh, did you, uh, why didn't the Air Force operate the OV-10 with two-man crews? They did in Vietnam. Uh, they did in Vietnam, and they usually had somebody in the back seat uh, helping with uh controlling naval fire or artillery fire. Uh, but in the Cold War that I flew them in Europe, we, we were single pilot, single pilot. Uh, uh, let's see, who else we got? Uh, hello, Lewis Total. Uh, um, says, Gary, what, uh, what in your view on the F-15 EX? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yes. I am definitely talking. I like the EX. It's a great idea just because I'm partial to the Eagle. I just, boy, for what it does and where it can go and what it can carry, man, there's just nothing out there from on the uh, American side. There, of course, there's other airplanes out there. It's too bad that uh, Tornado got retired, but you guys, you guys got some great airplanes over there too. So, but from the American side, uh, the EX is pretty cool. I like the EX, um, but you know, again, that's a brand new concept. So I don't really know much other than what you guys do, what you read. Uh, Manu Forte, uh, 40, I guess I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> what was your call sign? There are, there are those of us that, um, let's just say, highlight ourselves in doing events and things that we get call signs. We don't, it's not like the Navy. Um, you usually do something... Um, in famous, um, <laughs> which is also infamous. And I went through multiple call signs. Uh, started out with Niedermeyer, and then I went to Lewis, as in Lewis and Clark Expedition, to uh, Ambassador Green, to the librarian, because I'm so quiet. 
till finally got to the end and someone said, you know, this poor guy suffers from call, multiple call sign disorder. So at the very end, they called me psycho uh, because I had multiple call sign disorder and it seems to fit. So, <laughs> uh, dude, man, I'm telling you, uh, what was I thinking sometimes? Uh, but very, very kind for you to ask. Um, let's see. Uh, combat aviationist, can you talk about the Olympics event Ooh, in South Korea? Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> this is going to take a little bit. Okay. 1988, Summer Olympics, uh, Seoul, South Korea. We're at Osan Air Base. I think it's about an hour south south uh west of uh seoul i think if i remember correctly 1988 and i'm sitting alert uh there's two of us and air defense alert and it just so happened that i was uh assigned to my actual aircraft uh, tail number 522 it had my name on and we come in and we're getting ready to take over our the duties i think it's at uh, 0900 and um we get called over to the uh, RF4 uh, alert shack where the reconnaissance guys are. And we go into the safe and the, the word, the two of us are thinking, what the heck is going on? And we get briefed and they, uh, there's going to be some trouble in the Summer Olympics in uh, North Korea, which did not want South Korea to be able to do this back in 88. And um, well, there's going to be some MiGs coming down to disrupt. Um, and so they said, be, expect to launch shortly. And so we go, we look at each other and go, oh, way cool. And we go head back to our side, the F-15 side, alert shack. And uh, we're just hipping up our G suits. We're putting everything back. I mean, really in order quickly. And all the ground crew guys are like going, what's going on? And they're looking at us and we're looking at them and <clears throat> the alarm goes off and we bolt. Uh, and we head out to the jet. We start the jet. Uh, we're our standard alert configurations, what every uh, C model uh, air to air F 15s. We didn't fly with um, wing tanks, we only flew, flew with the center line back then. And so we had four by four by gun, and that's uh, four AIM 7 mics, four AIM 9 mics, and then 940 rounds of 20 millimeter. And so off we, we blast off. Now, this is my one and only real world, no kidding, alert scramble. So as I get out to the runway and um, they launch the, uh, the um, aircraft, um, I mean, I launched the aircraft, so I had a message come up. Uh, I'm rolling down the runway and I think, well, this is it. So I rotate, suck the gear back up, and then I'm just sitting right above the runway. And I'm accelerating by the end of the runway, which is about um, maybe a mile and a half uh, later. There's this big hotel right at the end of the runway. And I got to it and I just pulled for everything I had. As I'm getting ready to pull to go up, because uh, we're going to have to go up and then go behind us, so kind of like an Immelman maneuver, I get my lock shoot lights that are up on the canopy saying that my radar has locked onto something and I'm within parameters to shoot. And I'm just cruising down and I'm thinking, what the heck is that going on for? And all of a sudden I look up and I go, whoa, there's a building. Boom. And I pull. And they, the guys on the ground said, because there's enough moisture in the air that it just vaporized the aircraft. And they all thought the next thing was going to be an explosion because Gary hit the, hit the building. But I, as I pull up, there's an overcast sky wondering, what the heck is going on? All of a sudden as I break through, there's two A-10s coming this direction. I go right between the A-10s. They're 3,000 feet uh, headed somewhere. And I'm thinking, geez, just a little bit left or right, and it would have been a midair. And so I head back, and I catch up to lead, and I literally rejoin lead, and I'm still upside down. <laughs> he tells me, hey, yo, two, roll out. And I roll out like this, and, oh, man, my head kind of goes off to the side there, and I go, oh, man. And off we go, <clears throat> headed out to go find the MiGs. And sure enough, we found them. And if they got feet dry, which means over land, uh, we were going to be clear to kill. So we had to convince them not to do that because we didn't want to start World War III. But if we did start World War III, I thought it would be really cool because my name's on the jet. My name would be in the history books, assuming there's a history book after World War III. So anyway, <clears throat> we uh, did an intercept on them and closed in on them. And the good news is they decided to turn around. And then after that, we decided to come back home. 
And uh, it was uh, pretty thrilling. It was, um, we got to debrief and we got to talk to some really big wigs in the U.S. government on this. This was, uh, this was really cool to get to do. Thank you for asking. That was, uh, that was, that was probably one of the, the greatest experiences I've ever had flying uh, an F-15 and just doing the real world job. I just I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you're wondering why I'm looking over, um, because I'm trying to read the, the messages over here. Um, let's see if I can find what's another question out there. Um, let's see if I can find call sign. I read, okay, uh, Elaine, can, can I get a, hey, uh, you've lost that love and feeling. Yeah, baby. Nope. I don't think there's any of them out there. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not going to get rid of mine. There's too many great memories on this one. We, uh, it would have been uh, mid 80s. I think it's 86. I think that's when it was when Top Gun came out. Maybe it was 85 or whatever it was. And uh, we were headed uh, going to the Philippines to do first our weapons weapons test, uh, where you get to shoot uh, missiles against a drone. I got to shoot an A9 Lima, uh, and then at follow that's a week. And then following that, we start a, I think it's, if I remember correctly, a two week, um, uh, big, huge engagement of us versus the Navy, uh, the Air Force versus the Navy. I mean, we had uh, weasels out there, the F4Gs out there, regular F4s carrying bombs. And I think we had the F16s from Misawa. I think we had them there. And we were going to go against the uh, uh, Marine Top Gun guys that are flying F4s and A4s out of QB. And the Vincent, Carl Vincent, is uh, coming into the area. And so that's how we got to fight the F-14s and uh, A-6s, A-7s, I think. God, I can't remember. But anyway, <clears throat> since we knew we were going to fight F-14s, that's why we got the patch. Uh, and the coolest thing in uh, Okinawa, Japan, is all we had to do is uh, fly up to Seoul, South Korea, and they made patches. You just give them a design, and these people could do it on a sewing machine, and they, they could make the patch just freehanding. It's just incredible. This is this patch here is uh, all uh, uh, threads. You can still see the thread count, the thread across there. The, the, they're just artisans, and so we can come up with all sorts of ones. We got uh, this one right here, MIG busters, and it's all just regular stitching, just freehand stitching. So it's pretty cool. <clears throat> pretty cool. Um, uh, there's or, one, uh, oh, Gary, oh, if oh. you can hear me here, uh, just be, yeah. uh, below uh, combat aviation. It's like you missed one, which I think is a really great question what, uh, from where, GR. Yeah, GR Heathrow. Do you think the F 15 C is still a good aircraft for aerial combat, or do you think it needs to be replaced? If you can see that, if you scroll up a bit. I'm scrolling up. I'm looking. I'm looking. So I got. Con can you talk about uh, Olympics event in South Korea? Is it above that? Uh, yes, just below that, yeah, uh, J.R. Heathrow. Oh, J.R. Heathrow, yeah. There you go. Do you think the F-15C is a good aircraft for aerial combat or it needs to be replaced? That's a great question, and doggone it, you know, if I was still flying, I would probably um, be able to authentically answer that question. You know, it's still, I assume it's still a 9G platform. I, I'm, um, I still assume, you know, it's got all of it. I don't know. I can't remember flying with the wing tanks if we could do 9Gs. I can't remember, to be honest with you. I know with the centerline we could. Um, and it's still a really good air-to-air -air platform uh, against older MiGs. I just, that's a great question, and I sure wish I had an answer for you. I'm going to say yes, just because I know the F-15 can do some really great stuff. Um, but, you know, with the F-22 out there, the F-35, eh. Um, but the F-22 is a pretty good frame. Uh, the, new, the newer F-16s. Yeah, the Israelis are still using the uh, F-15. Uh, and, you know, they had the Bacall Valley War that they just, just tore into everybody. And they're still using it in an air-to-air -air role, so... <clears throat> you know, I got to think, uh, um, yeah, it's still a good platform would be my guess, my best uh, guess on that thing. Um, so anyway, um, 
I love it. Can you lo lost that love and feeling? Um, I love this. Uh, Jacob Rick, do you think pilots will be phased out in favor of drones? Unfortunately, yes. I do think that's where it's going. I, and I think that's a big mistake. Uh, the Freckle Penny uh, Punny again asks, what is the fastest and highest you went in the F-15? We were limited we, uh, by regulation. You could only go to 50,000 feet because the regulation says if you go above 50,000 feet, you got to have a pressure suit. I never did that. And the fastest that we could go with the center line was 1.7. And I've done 1.7 on the mock. Uh, when they would do an SCF flight, when it comes out of big maintenance, like they do an engine or whatever, they clean the tank off and it'd have to do 2.0 because that's what it, you have to go above 2.0 in the F-15. And so those maintenance guys could do that. Uh, Alexander Vetter, um, ever revisited Simbach Air Base? Yes, I have. I got to do that for my retirement. Uh, my wife agreed to it. I think she was in favor of it. <laughs> we flew into Frankfurt. And the first thing we did is went to Heidelberg. And then from Heidelberg, we drove down and got to go to Simbach and went through uh, Frankenstein. God, that was a great town. <clears throat> and then Simbach. And I've got a couple pictures of me, especially because the tower's still there. So that was pretty cool. Um, let's see. What else have we got here? Um answer the questions can you comment on how dact against tomcats and other compared defending on uh, uh depending on weapons restrictions i'm thinking using lima's uh, aim nine lima's uh and fox one or threes <clears throat> we we got it was fortunate you know being in pacaf in the pacific uh air war uh air theater there was all sorts of airplanes. I mean, from 104s, the Jazz Daft still flew 104s. Um, God, a zipper jet. What a jet. Uh, 111s. Uh, I've even tried to engage a C-130. That didn't go very well. B-52s. Uh, all the F-4s. All sorts of F-4s. F-16s. Um, A-10s. Suey pig. Ooh, hogs. I'm telling you what, we had a uh, close air support Cope Thunder, which is like red flag. And um, the, uh, we were the red air. Uh, the F-15s were the bad guys. I think we were simulating the uh, SU-27s or something like that. And um, <clears throat> so our job was to just go find everybody. I really wanted to fly an OB, uh, find an OB-10 just because it would have been really cool since he slam. Couldn't find them. They're too low to the ground. But we found the hogs. And I'm going to tell you what. That was a heck of an engagement. There was probably six at least four for sure. And as we roll in, uh, somebody picked us up and I'm telling you what, the hogs just turned and they just circled the hogs. I mean, whoa, you did not want to get into that uh, fray for sure because the hog's going to outturn you. Man, with that straight wing, lots of lift. Uh, so the only way you could defeat a hog that's in a level turn was you had to go vertical to, to, to be able to... Um, to be able to have any type of engagement so you can come down on them like this. <clears throat> but with that 30 millimeter can cannon out in front of them, yee, gad. So um, it had to be a real vertical fight for us to keep ourselves safe uh, against the hogs. Just turn, I mean, they turn and dude, there's not much you can do about it uh, for a gun kill. Um, you know, we could shoot at a aim, you know, uh, sevens out there, aim nines, everybody can do that. But to try and get a gun kill, that's a totally different story. And the same way with fighting the F-14s, you know, you 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 pass them uh, close aboard on uh, the top on the turkeys, and both everybody's going to turn. That's what's going to happen, and you'll see their wings come out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, you know, once the wings come out, you know that you don't want to get into a slow speed turning fight with an F-14 because it's just going to outturn you with those wings straight out like that. Good gosh. So you've got to be able to figure out a different way to defend yourself uh, and exploit their weaknesses. Uh, they're heavier jet. They don't have as much uh, of power as the Eagle did because we had a lot of power. So we try to get vertical. And if we got slow, we wanted to get into a vertical scissors fight uh, with them. You definitely did not stay in the horizontal plane with them because they're going to outturn. Same way with the hog. It's going to outturn you. There's just no two ways about it. So the, the DACT was, was really, uh, man, that was cool in PACF because there are so many different kinds of jets out there. 
Thank you for that question. That's a great one. I, uh, for us, the AIM-9 mic was uh, the P sub K, uh, probably kill, I think, gosh, 98, 99%, something like really high like that. So you knew if you took a shot with a mic, you were, you were, it was going to be a good shot. Um, Nate White, right. Hey, Gary, did you ever over G and yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes you get a little bit too, um, excited. Uh, you really turn the jet hard or something. In the Eagle, we had a tone that as you approached, I think it was 80%. I think that's what it was. You got a deep, 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 deep tone knowing that you're approaching the max with the G and the turn or whatever, rolling Gs or whatever. And then it one goes beep, 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 beep. And that means you're at 90%. And then the next thing you heard is Betty. We call her Bitchin' Betty because uh, she's always yelling at us, you know, low fuel, whatever it is. She'd say, over G, over G, over G, over G. Now, um, when we come back and land, there were certain parameters when you pulled up on the uh, so on the radar where the radar scope is that uh, it was kind of the early versions of a multifunction display. It's over here on the uh, left side of our canopy, I mean our cockpit, and you could pull up the readout, I mean the digital readout, and under certain parameters of whatever that readout was, we were allowed to clear off and it was not considered technically an over G uh, because I think they uh, cushioned the over G warnings. But if you went over that, dude, and I understand my jet 522, somebody told me that uh, they did something, somebody was flying it and they really over G the airplane. And it's now going out to the boneyard from what I understand, which is sad because it was flying with, I think the Fresno Air National Guard. Uh, Nate asked again. Yes, I did over G. Okay. And I'm trying to get to everyone I can here. Um, um, hey, uh, Boris Johnson asked, Hey, Gary, did the F-15 always have no turkey feathers? Yeah, baby, turkey feathers. Uh, I think the A models did. They always had them. Uh, I think when I flew at Tyndale and I flew the A models, they had turkey feathers. And uh, at Kadena, they were taking them off. And so we lost the turkey feathers uh, somewhere before I got there, somewhere around 86, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think that's what it was. Um, uh, so, yes, I, I did over G, and yes, they did have turkey feathers. Uh, Tony, uh, uh, boy, I'm, I don't know how to, Wellens, Llewellyn, if I pronounce that right, and I apologize. Did you ever try landing an LV-10 on our air carrier? No. Always wanted to. The Marine Corps got to, but I didn't. So, yuck. Didn't like that. Um, hey, Gary, uh, this is from Templar. What action, actual action did you take uh, the wonderful Eagle into? The, um, the closest I ever got to actual shooting war was the uh, Korea um, uh, Olympics. So uh, let's see what else have we got here. Um, Stephen uh, Asbury, if the F-14 had the Phoenix available, oh, dude, the Phoenix was out. With, yeah, that's where you got to reach out and touch somebody. Um, our AIM-7 mics could go a long way, but nothing like the Phoenix. So we always, <clears throat> we'd always brief. It's easy to shoot somebody in the face. That, that's so easy to do. You just lock them up, whoosh, send the missile. So anybody could do that. The, the big test of everybody is once you pass close aboard. So you can take all the shots we would say, you can take all the shots you want outside, but no kills until you pass the three nine line. And three nine line is uh, in front of you is 12 o'clock, behind you six o'clock. You've got three on the right, nine on the left. So uh, clock position. So once you pass the three nine line, now it's fights on. Now it's you, whatever shot you can take, you get. And so uh, there's two ways to do it. You both could turn into each other and it becomes this gigantic two-circle fight. For me, the best thing I to uh, uh, go against the deficiencies of the enemy aircraft that I'm flying against, whatever, 14s, 16s, whatever it was, F-4s, uh, and to uh, enlarge my capability, the F-15, is you would fake to make it a two-circle fight, and then I'd turn and go pure vertical. And for some reason, for me, going pure vertical, is a 
a way that I could um, press the attack and become very offensive. For some reason, a lot of people, whenever they fly, they're only, for the average, they're only plus or minus 30 degrees of the horizon. That Back when I was flying, because air to air of an F-15 and all that kind of stuff was, was still fairly new. I know it's hard for you to believe, but it's just, uh, people were flying F-4s and transitioning to F-15s in a true air to air world. The, um, it, that's what we were taught in F-15 school. And so exploiting the vertical uh, seemed to be a good tactic for me uh, a lot of times because the sun's sitting up there. That's another thing because I can get in the sun and lose sight. Uh, that's where I thought I was going to beat an F-18. And le le later did I know that he ate my lunch. That's a whole other story. But anyway, I go pure vertical like this. And that way I can come down on the target that may be just doing a horizontal turn. Uh, there's this thing uh, that we refer to called the BFMA. B BFM stands for Basic Fighter Maneuvers. Uh, I think the the squids and the Marines use ACM, Air Combat Maneuvering. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> it looks like an A. And what happens is, is, as you're trying to pull out, gravity is working against you. So even though you're, you're pulling at, say, seven or eight Gs, it's actually one G less because you're fighting what they call God's G, the Earth's G. Whereas at the top of the egg, you've got an extra G available because gravity is helping to pull you down. And so you can get a really good nose rate against somebody that's doing more of a horizontal turn. So that nose rate is what gets you around the corner here to be able to try and get to his high six because that's where we can shoot the gun is when we get to what's called the high six, this being a, the six o'clock. And so everybody's maneuvering to that because that's what the true test of being a fighter guy is that you want to get to a gun solution because it's the most difficult thing to do. That's for doggone sure. The most difficult thing to do. Uh, let's see. Uh, you say fee or pack gaff, which did you prefer? I loved them both. Man, you safety was cool. When I was there, uh, it was fights on from the moment you took off. I, I'm telling you, it was fights on because you could attack anybody. The only thing you had to honor was uh, 3,000 feet and five miles radius of an airport. After that, everything was fights on. So that was cool. PACAF, man, PACAF is huge. My God, that ocean's big. I know that's really hard for most of you to believe, but yes, the Pacific Ocean is big. Okay, um, let's see what else we got. Uh, did you operate an F-15 with AM? No, the AIM-120 AMRAM was this new concept when I was in the 80s. Dude, we didn't even have, uh, we call them flaff and chaff, uh, flare and chaff dispensers. Uh, the, the 120 and the missup jets, that was all... Yeah, right. Sure, that's going to happen. Classified stuff. We're never going to see that. So, no, I never got to see what an, uh, AIM, uh, an AMRAM was. Uh, Stephen Hampton, do you wish you could have uh, gone to this storm? Hell yeah. I was in the airlines, couldn't. Um, would, would have loved to have gone there. Um, ben Johnson, did Zool alert pilots in Europe, Bitburg and Schusterberg always scramble uh, in G-suits? Yes. You always had, you wore your G-suit all the time, whether you're Schusterberg or Kadian or Okinawa, I mean, or uh, Osan, yes, your G-suit was on because you had a couple of minutes, two or three minutes, something like that, if I remember correctly, to be airborne. It, it, you had to be fully dressed, combat boots, and you slept in it too because you didn't know when you're going to call if you got called at three o'clock in the morning. So you slept in everything, combat boots, the whole nine yards. The only thing that was, what was not on me was the um, helmet, and I think we had the harnesses in the jet. I don't think we had the harnesses. I can't, I, gosh, I can't remember. Uh, try, if I'm pronouncing it, try, try. Hello, Gary, I'm from France. Do you have a chance to meet and exercise with French pilots? Dude, um, that was something else. I'm telling you what, those guys, they're crazy sometimes. We have this picture. This was so cool. Um, one of our guys, I can't remember his name, but anyway, 
he and when we're in the OB tens and we <laughs> he we were doing a close air support or whatever it was and talking to the French pilots and, and uh, some mirage obviously and there's this cool picture of uh, flying formation on the wing and the French mirage is like this right at the stall and the uh, OB ten is like this pushing max speed just because the speed differences is trying to hang together so that was really cool and uh, I got to do the Netherlandic F5s those guys really crazy lost an engine that was a whole different story too man whoop that was a whole different story when I lost the engine in the OB 10 yeehaw um, hi uh, will the move towards BVR uh, network concentric warfare reduce the ACM pilots God I hope not I'm gonna tell you what you never know when you're going to meet another jet and you're going to pass close aboard and you've got to figure out a way to get to the high six and kill this guy. Um, God, I hope not. God, I hope not. Uh, Mr. Assist, did you do any of the split throttle moves? Um, that would be classified. And if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Um, no, I did not do any of that stuff because it was against the rules. So no, I did not. Um, uh, I think, <laughs> I can't remember, holy cow, that was years ago, uh, YouTuber, YouTuber, what's the funniest thing you saw while flying as well as the craziest thing? Um, funniest thing, that obviously the OV-10 and the Mirage, that was pretty funny, that was, yo, that was weird, um, the, uh, craziest thing um probably has to be um we're doing a mission in the philippines we're doing something i think it was or was it cope north uh thunder some somewhere up in i think it was up in um south korea we were at a Kwangju. that was our ford operating location <laughs> and we're doing some some DACT 2v2, 2v5, something like that. I can't remember what it was. And um, as I'm peeling off to go ahead to sort somebody else, I look over my right side and on my right wing, <laughs> there is a piece of my wing that is up and it's about, oh, probably like this, triangular shape. It's about this big and it's, and it's up and I can see the paint on this side and on the other side I could see the silver on the other side and I think I've been shot dude I've been shot oh my god somebody in South Korea just shot me oh my god it's got this big huge hole in my airplane because I, I, I couldn't see if there really was a hole in my airplane but I just assumed it because this thing's sticking up you know so I declare an emergency oh my god we're gonna die um, type thing, we come back and land, and you know, Flight Lead came down as a wingman, Flight Lead comes down, looks at me, kids, I don't get any problems, I go, dude, there's something sticking up on my wing, anyway, we land, and, uh, <laughs> oh my god, I get down, I get, I get out of the cockpit, down the ladder, maintenance has already got some scaffolding to get up on the wing, I jump up on the wing, because the maintenance guy, he'd already pulled it off, and he handed it to me, I, I, it's in my garage, I could go get it, but I uh, don't have the time, and it was this gigantic amount of speed tape that they had put on the wing because the wings were out of balance, whatever that means. It was all out of balance, and they needed to put more weight and something on the wing. And um, anyway, the squadron had a lot of fun at my expense on that one because I thought I was going to die because I got shot. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the crazier. There's a couple more, but that, that, was, pretty, that was pretty crazy. Um, uh, uh, let's see, let's find another strategical celery, dude, what a great call sign. So did you ever experience a near death experience? Yes. Yes. There's been a couple of them, <clears throat> both in the OB 10 and the F 15. We're at, um, a Cope Thunder in the Philippines, uh, Clark Air Force Base, uh, which is now gone because of Mount Pinatubo blew the volcano. Anyway, we're going against, we know we've got two F-4s. We're going to go against two air-to-air F-4s. And I, they're either the Philippines or the Tegu. I can't remember because Tegu was still an air-to-air F-4 squadron. 
That's how long ago I flew when F4 is still a, a solid air to air squadron. And so we're two v two. We're coming at, at each other, and so we're trying to do our radar locks, and then we're sweeping the radar. And typically, the way it goes is lead. Uh, his sort priority is lead trail. In other words, the leader will always tag the leader. The wingman will always tag the uh, trailer. Uh, if you're side side, it's always whichever one I'm on tactical. We would fly tactical formation, which is typically about a mile, mile and a half. Uh, uh, abreast each other and then typically 2,000 feet low or high. A lot of it depends on where the sun is, the sun angle. So we're going like this and I'm like brand new. This is like my first Coke Thunder type deal. And we're coming at him and so we sort. So you bring the acquisition symbols in from the direction you're coming in and you lock the target. So I had locked my target. He had locked his target. Life is good. We're not going to call any kills until we pass the 3-9 line because that's just the way it is. And so we launch our aim sevens at him and we're going. So I think I have locked this guy that's over here on my side. So I'm trying to find this guy. I'm trying to find to see if I can visually acquire because what you would do is you'd shoot an aim seven and then you would lock, uh, you would uh, use the heat uh, signal from the seeker head to find the other guy. And that way you could launch an aim nine at him to get two kills. Uh, before you even uh, go line and breast. So I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking. And then all of a sudden, dude, that hair on the back of my head stands up and I get this unbelievable fear feeling like just, ah! Uh, and I decide to take my eyes from looking over here trying to find the target. And I look straight ahead and literally the F4 is right there. And we are beak to beak with each other. And uh, before I knew what was happening, the F4 had gone right past me, literally right over me, like, uh, and the bow wave from that F4 uh, shook the jet. And I'm, if he had been two feet lower, he would have hit my tails and we would have all turned into space dust. I mean, I'm not kidding you. When, you. when you turn and you look and you see this double ugly, this rhino in front of you, big, beefy aircraft and all of a sudden it just boom goes right past you like that and it shifts the jet and it's just like uh that was you know one of those whoa i could have been space dust type deal so yeah that was my definite near-death experience that whoa got my attention so i decided to go ahead and spend more time looking around uh, whenever I locked onto a target. Um, let's see, who have we got here? Uh, Mr. Assist, uh, you have talked about the how the Hornet <laughs> got your lunch. Yeah, it ate my lunch. Dude, did you manage to win one? Uh, no, because uh, we, we'd never seen F-18s. They were brand new, they're off the Midway. Um, and the midway had to go into the dock to get a bunch of funky things put on the hull to make it more stable or something like that. I, I just learned this because I work out at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum and the uh, F-18 that's, that we have uh, that l later went on to fly a, um, as a Blue Angel uh, was one of the F-18s I got to engage against, which was really interesting. Um, I just, you, you're, it was just really difficult. You did not want to get into a slow fight. So we had to learn a different set of maneuvering, a different set of, um, of attacks, because we, that's how we would win every fight we'd get. If you got slow with somebody, you were going to win just because the Eagle could do 90 knots and nobody else could do that. Um, so on the F-18, and I, did, did we win engagements later on? Probably yes but I don't remember because it's the one where you failed uh, that you remember the most because that's how you learn from your mistakes. That's how you learn to become a better fighter pilot is when those things happen. Um, and I love that. Sam, Sam says fast packs, bleh, bleh. canoes, yuck, yuck. Talk about stopping the jet, bleh. because we can only do 1.2 with canoes on, on fast packs. Whereas with the center line and a single seat, uh, Eagle, we could do 1.7. Uh, let's see, what have we got? Uh, ben Johnson, have you um, 
uh, ever display the F-15 air shows. Uh, yes, we would do uh, air shows all the time, uh, whether it's there at Kadena or uh, Clark or anywhere else. Um, that was just the standard. You just did that when the weather was good. Um, uh, Helsvac, Helsvac, I guess is how you pronounce it. My bad if I didn't. Uh, since you were an F-15 pilot in the 1980s, what Cold War, uh, Cold War era Soviet jet fighters did you think posed the greatest threat? Um, there was a rumor, uh, uh, there was intel coming on to that. I think it was the flanker, the Su-27. And the intel was telling us this was uh, their F-15 and it had some serious capabilities. So we spent a lot of time studying them. Uh, the MiG-21, the fish bed, you know, that's why we had the aggressor squadrons flying uh, FIVs uh, to get the training. Because, man, if you if you didn't pay attention, uh, those fish beds, because there were so many of them. Oh, my gosh, there are so many of them in North Korea. They could they could make your life very difficult. Just a simple fish bed. I mean, it's just uh, carrying atolls. Man, I'm telling you. But I think it was the Sioux, the Sioux, I think 27 flankers, is that what it is? I think that's what it is. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Somebody I haven't talked to. Marco, uh, SRBA, if I did that right. F-117 Stealth was a nice uh, plane. Sorry, but we didn't know it was invisible. Um, yeah, the 117, I did not know anything about it. And my... T-38 IP, instructor pilot, when I went through T-38 training, he ended up getting to go fly them. And uh, I finally ran into him, and boy, interesting aircraft. Woo-wee! I've got, aircraft. like, a, just to interrupt you here, Gary, yeah. uh, like, I'd be, I'd be interested to see, like, uh, just above that was from H. Uh, did you ever tangle with the Aardvarks, which is obviously the F-111? Uh, the Varkies? Uh, the Varks? You know... It, this is going to be weird. I mean, people are going to go, eh. Uh, the Aardvark, the 111's down there in the weeds, and they're going warp nine down in the weeds. And that is a huge um, protection for the Aardvarks. Anybody that can get down in the weeds, that's a big deal. Even though we had to look down, shoot down radar. Um, and even though we could do a lot, uh, more than I can tell you how many times we weren't allowed to do BVR kills. Nothing that wasn't allowed. You had to get a visual on it. So the aardvark is sitting down here, literally down in the weeds, and I'm up here doing whatever it is I have to do up there. So uh, once I could see it, I'd make my conversion, a high load conversion. And this is funny. It's the same exact thing with the Jazdaf 104s. And you'd make this turn to, to, to try and go in and, and uh, attack an aardvark. You have to turn way out in front of him because you know he's going so fast. But by the time I could get around the corner to where my missile, uh, the AIM-7, the radar missile, is in range to be able to take this thing based on the speed it's going, it would go from you could shoot to, nope, you can't shoot. And this thing would, it was like he just downshifted and then it was gone. Uh, both he and the 104 were the same way. It, and it's funny. Doing the same type of conversion on a C-130 that's down in the weeds, um, as you start to convert and come down on this thing, it's amazing the ground rush that comes up as you're starting to come down on anything that's down in the weeds. Um, that ground rush, which is just coming up through your canopy, I mean, it fuels everything you can see. It gets to be extremely uh, intimidating to figure out as you come around the corner to be able to shoot this thing. And the whole thing, you're while you're doing this conversion from high to low, the big thing is, is what's out there behind you as you make this conversion? Because you're not going to be able to see it because you're spending too much time making sure you don't hit the dirt. Uh, you know, the probability of kill, that's a big thing we would always say. What's the P sub K of an AIM-7 mic? What's the P sub K of an AIM-9? We always say the P sub K the probability of kill of the ground is 99.9%. .9%. So you, 
it, it's an intimidation factor that is huge. And so that's why those guys get to do what they get to do is because they're down in the weeds, man. They're down, they're down way down there, right around the weeds. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, Elaine Wesley, as much as I love the Eagle, I feel that we have not touched on your OB10 much. Did you feel uh, she would have protected you? And <laughs> okay, this is one of the reasons why in Western Europe, West Germany, that eventually Congress and the military guys said, you know, we need to bring the OB10s out. Uh, our biggest threat, which we knew that would eat our lunch, was the ZSU-23-4, the quads uh, for that tracked vehicle. It was it, We were toast. And the hind helicopter, the MI-24, if I remember correctly, that hind helicopter, I mean, we wanted to hang around the A-10s, the hogs, because they were our big brothers and they were going to be our protectors. But man, if you got out there and you, you ran into one of these, it was game over. And uh, man, the uh, OV-10 just in a high threat environment and a high threat war like that, we just didn't have the defense capability. You know, low threat or medium threat, yes, we could do it. Uh, they did it very well. The Marines did in um, Gulf War One, uh, but man, in a high threat environment, when you're looking at Zeus 24s and and the hind helicopters, woo, not a good thing. Not a good thing. Uh, Kilo 19, um, I love it. Uh, what was the OB-10 like dealing with an engine failure? Um, it'll get your attention. Uh, we're in um, somewhere in the Netherlands. I can't remember. Twente. Twente Air Base in the Netherlands. It's probably not even there anymore because uh, it's 40 years ago. And we had done a, a big workup with the Netherland, Netherlandic F-5s and some other aircraft to do close air support. And so we're, we're headed home. It's a Friday. We're headed home. There's a three ship of us. And so we're flying in fingertip formation because there's weather uh, from about 1,000 feet all the way up to, I don't know, the 15. So we're going to go home at like 18, flight level 180. So we're flying together real close to fingertip as we're climbing out, we're climbing out like this and we're headed up. And as, as we're climbing up, I start to smell something in the, uh, which is really weird because I had an oxygen mask on because we knew we were going to go high altitude, which is weird. How could I do that? But something just didn't seem right. And then all of a sudden, as I'm sitting on the left wing of this guy, the airplane literally rolls upside down and dies. Uh, if I had been, if it had been the left engine, I would have taken the two guys out, and there would be three uh, OB tens and uh, pilots that are dead. Uh, so the airplane rolls upside down and goes down, and is, is screaming down. I think it was like about eight thousand feet. You know, and this is the funny thing about flying uh, jets. <laughs> I'm a, I think a first lieutenant, and as this thing rolls over and starts to go down, you'd think that the first thing I would do is want to recover the airplane, you know, aviate, navigate, communicate. That's the standard thing. So you'd think so. No, not me. I'm thinking, what did I screw up and what's wrong? And so my first indication is to look at the engine instruments and look at the cockpit. Dumbest move. Dude, what were you thinking? As opposed to flying the airplane. And so it's screaming down. And as it's screaming down, I just get this really weird feeling. I think something's, and because it's not, there's nothing a checklist or nothing that we can figure out what it is. And so I go ahead and I think, well, I probably need to shut that engine down. <laughs> Gee, you think? Um, and so the first thing I'm supposed to do is feather the aircraft. And so I feather the, the uh, airplane. Uh, so I feather the propeller, I'm sorry, because uh, we have controllable pitch propeller. So I feather the, the propeller and then shut it down. And as I'm still going downhill and the, the engine's turned off and the propeller goes from flat, it was what happened is, is the propeller snapped into flat pitch. So I have three bladed prop that's flat, like a gigantic speed brake as it's spinning around at 100% power like this. So that's the reason why the airplane went upside down. And so as I feathered the airplane, I was, I was thinking back when I was a kid watching 12 o'clock high, the TV series. Of course, none of you guys know that because none of you as old as me. But that was so cool when they would they'd get shot up and somebody would say, feather number three. 
And so I feathered it, and, and it was funny. Whenever I put a G-load on the airplane, turn it, the propeller would start to turn. I think, oh, man, that's really cool. The things you think about when you're in your young 20s flying a fighter is just insane. I, I'm lucky to be alive. Anyway, so as I'm flying, and, and I'm trying to level off so that I could cruise back to the Twente Air Base, and it's not happening. It's not going to happen. Now, once I feathered the airplane, feathered the propeller, you had to hold just a little bit of rudder in. But other than that, it flew great. It just was underpowered. It just didn't have enough thrust at the other engine that's going full power to keep me from descending. I was going down at probably about two to 300 feet per minute. And uh, talking to other guys that have lost engines, everyone says the exact same thing. So the whole idea is, is to get you away from the combat area so that you can go land somewhere. That was the whole purpose of the way the engine, one of the way the engines were configured. So as I'm coming down, I'm coming down, I'm coming down. And I realize I'm not going to make the airport. It's, it's not going to happen. I can't get there. And I, how do I know that? I don't know. I, I can't remember. It, you just know these things. I guess it's, it's an experience of when you, you get a lot, enough time in an airplane that you kind of get an idea. You just feel what it can and can't do. And I can't explain it. It's just, it's just, it's weird. I think it's, it's interesting. You just, you just feel it. So I said, okay, to the controllers who are speaking Danish a lot and broken English. And I said, I need to, I need a vector away from any uh, crowded area. Cause I need to puke off my stores. Literally. That's what I said. When I meant puke my stores, I mean a jettison the centerline tank and the two rocket pods we were carrying because I knew that I couldn't make it to the runway. And of course, the poor Danish controller, he's, he's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and, and he's saying, and I said, okay, I need you to vector me away from the city so that I can go ahead and jettison my external stores because I don't want to hit anybody in the city. And so he vectors me over and I'm in a, over to a farmer's field and he says, whenever you want to, go ahead. And I go, I have no idea. I can't see anything. I'm in the weather. And he says, do it now. So I push the button. Uh, we have a little button at the top right of our, of our um, uh, glare shield. And it's got a red, fine, uh, hermetically sealed thingy over the button so that you know that if you ever push the button, you're going to break that little seal thing. So maintenance can say, okay, yeah, you did this. And again, it's just one of those weird things when you're sitting there and I went to push the button and of course everything falls off the airplane. Life is low, life is good. And the next thing that happens is on my uh, panel of warning lights, the external transfer fuel light comes on. And I think, what the heck else is gonna go wrong with this jet, Dead gummit? And of course the external transfer fuel light is gonna come on because the external tank is gone. The whole way down the chute, I kept thinking, why is my center line not feeding? Dude, it's just one of those things. So we come in, and as I'm approaching the runway, I get a call from the tower. The F5s, the Netherlandic F5s, are behind me, and they asked me to make the, the, single, uh, the first taxiway turnoff because they are emergency fuel. So you got two emergencies, me with an engine failure, and those guys were running out of gas. So... I say, you know, being the super cool fighter pilot that I am, I said, sure, I can do that. And um, <laughs> what do you think as a 20-year-old? So uh, I come in. As soon as I drop the gear, I lost about uh, probably 10 knots of airspeed. And so I knew immediately if I had kept the all my external stores on there, the airplane probably would have gone into the ground. And I, was, I wasn't going to do that because I would have steered it away from any buildings. So that would cost me my life. Uh, so I land a touchdown, pull off the first taxiway, and literally as I'm starting to clear, the two FIs touch down and roll out, and um, they do whatever they're supposed to do. And as I shut down the engine, I get out, and I think, well, this is my first really big emergency. This is, like, cool, so I'm supposed to kiss the ground. So I get out, and I kiss the ground because, I don't know, somebody said that uh, somewhere or some movie star or something like that. The ambulance shows up. Now, I can't make this stuff up, dude. This is so real. Uh, difference between a fairy tale and a fighter pilot story. Fairy tale begins once upon a time. Fighter pilot story says, no kidding. No, you know what? This really happened. Well, this really happened. 
And so I'm standing there looking at him, the ambulance stop, pulls out, the doctor comes out, and I swear to God, the needle that he had in his hand was this long. I swear to God, it had to have been gigantic needle because he was going to hit me with something. And so I'm running around the airplane, and the doctor's coming around saying, stop, stop, stop. And I go, no, no, no. Anyway, so went to the bar that night, and the two F5 pilots bought me a whole bunch of beer and taught me how to drink uh uh, from their wagon wheel that hung up in their bar upside down. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Um, so that was that one. Uh, let's so see. Gary, uh, I'm just going to interrupt you here. If it's okay, uh, I'm okay. going to be I'm going to be a bit cheeky here. Are you happy to go on for another half an hour? Sure. I mean, it's, until my my uh, phone runs out of battery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's so far away from the plug. I don't know if I can plug it in. Uh, right. So if you want so, me to, I, I don't care. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, like, get. I'm still gonna find those F14 guys and say. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so, guys, get your questions in because it's gonna be. This is a privilege to have Gary on the show. So, we're gonna have him on till uh, half eight uh, UK time. So, you got thirty minutes to get your questions in. Uh, so, if you're new joining, Gary flew the OV10 and the F15. So, Gary, I'm gonna let you go again. Okay. Super. Um... Let's see. Uh, Mr. Seth says, was there a minimum altitude for the AIM-7 launch? That is a great question, and no, I don't remember. I'm betting there was, uh, just because of the ground clutter and everything else. Wow, what a cool question. I had no idea. Uh, uh, let's see, let's see, where am I? I lost my place. Uh, uh, Lola J, any random thoughts or opinions about the MH uh, three about three seventy? Dude, I dude, my no clue. Something all I can tell you, some happened and it'll remain a mystery. No clue, Captain Sully. I would be obsessed with Captain Sully too. That guy was a, that guy was that was he was awesome. That was. And his F4 training obviously came on that because he knew he could understand turning, he could understand distance traveling, what you can and can't do, and he could understand the glide path of, of dropping bombs, whether you do a 10 degree, a 30 degree, 45 degrees. He, he, dude, that that's what really helped him. Uh, uh, Sully's awesome. Sully's awesome. Um, ben Johnson, as far as the Aces 2 ejection seat, what other parameters were there if you high speed ejection? Don't. Dude. Somebody uh, went out above the mock and he didn't make it. He didn't he did not make it. The shoot worked, but he didn't make it. And uh, that's the problem is that if you eject at high speed, you're gonna be uh, there's gonna be some physical issues that you're gonna have to deal with just because of the you know, you come out of that canopy, you come out of that jet and the wind force, imagine supersonic air hitting you uh, as you come up, as you eject up out of there. It's um, it's not good. We've had a couple guys eject in, our, in my squadron. They were all at a much slower speed and uh, they did not have any medical issues afterwards. They just got to see what it was like to float in the water. Uh, for long hours until the rescue helicopter helicopters got to come see him uh, in the OV-10. <clears throat> I think it was a Martin Baker seat. I think. Anyway, I gotta love this. Is our sister squadron guy's gonna do? He's getting his instrument check ride in the OB-10. So we're taking off a of Simbok towards Ramstein. Anyway, as he as as he takes off, one of the engines fails on him. Something happens, and boom! And the airplane starts to roll a little bit. And he does something that I don't remember what it was but something that exasperated the situation, the airplane kept rolling. And the check pilot who's giving him a check ride is in the back seat. Boom, he pulls the rails, up he goes. Uh, handles, up he goes the rails. And the guy that's still flying, it gets literally to 90 degrees, which is outside of the ejection parameters. Boom, out he goes. And he is cruising out like this. He's five feet above the ground. So, I mean, if he waited a half a second longer, he'd be dead. So he's five feet above the ground. This is insane. Woo! Off he goes. And the chute opens up. And so it stops him from going. And he swings and hits the ground. Uh, so it's a five-foot drop. So it breaks his collarbone. No kidding. This, this really happened. Okay. 
there is a elderly German couple that's on a folks march. That's where they walk through the, uh, the um, uh, forest. They had literally just sat down to uh, eat their lunch at a picnic table where this guy, boom, he just hits the crowd, the seat's a little bit away from him. And, you know, of course, you can imagine their eyeballs are probably this big because it's not something you see every day. And so uh, I guess the, either which one of the two of the couple, one of them decides to walk back out of the forest and go find a policiai and uh, get them to come send an ambulance and rescue this guy. So needless to say, he busted his check ride as well he should. He busted his check ride. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, where else am I? Uh, somebody new here, uh, Wombology TM. I guess I pronounced that right. Uh, did you ever uh, try out an earlier AIM-7 like this, AIM-7S? The good news is, um, yes, we flew, when I first got there, we flew with the, uh, I think it was the S, I can't remember. So, no, I'm going to say no, I did not, because I was pretty sure we always had mics. We had mics and mic. Well, we had Lemus on the AIM-9s, but AIM-7 mic, which was a pretty good. Uh, before they painted them uh, the same color as the Jets, they're white colored. If you look at some of the A models out there carrying, uh, they're, uh, everything's painted white, uh, same way with the F-4s. Um, and so we would say, um, let's give the great white the lead on the right. And that was the whole idea is let that great white go out there and hit the target. So um, you had to uh, uh, lead it like a gun. I can't, I don't understand what's going. Wait until you latched on to returns. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Sim uh, Sedlow. Sedlo, do you, uh, did you do any practice for air to ground in the A or C model? That's interesting. The, we had C models at, at Kadena. All of them were C models. And um, they, I think they upgraded about a year before I got there, 78 uh, models. Um, and near the end of my tour, so it would have been early 88, I think, maybe, um, the general that took over PACAF, McPeat, he ends up being the Air Force uh, head dude, but McPeat was the commander for PACAF. And he had made the pronouncement that every jet in PACAF if the balloon went up and the war started, would take off with bombs. So that meant that each of the three F-15 squadrons, the 12th, the 67th, and us, the 44th, we had to get out there and get qualified to drop bombs. And so uh, they picked all the old F-4 guys that had converted. Uh, and I got picked to be the range control officer because I was a FAC, a forward air controller in the OV-10. So I knew range control procedures because I used to control airstrikes. And so, uh, I got selected. I got volunteered. And, um, what you had to do is in Okinawa, you had to drive to this, uh, port that was, I think, north of Kadena. And then you would, in your car, and then you would get on a ferry, and the ferry would then take you out to this island called Iishima. And that's where the range was, the air to ground, air to mud range uh, for the uh, Okinawa was. It was a, had a big, huge dirt uh, field, uh, concentric circles, so you could uh, gauge everything. And uh, range control tower. So I would get up in the range control tower and I would control it. And we would, the F-15 guys would come in, and I remember, I think it was our ops officer. He was, he was, he had spent a lot of time in the F-4, and he would, he constantly would always be pressing the minimum altitude. And so here you are, you're a new captain, and you got to throw the lieutenant colonel off the range because he keeps violating the thing. And so you had to give him warnings and and I thought, you know what? I think I'm just going to stay with the warnings. I'm not going to throw them off the range because, God, I got to see them. And it was a, um, it was probably about a four day tour. And the neat thing about it is it was considered a remote tour. So I got like huge TDY bucks. I think I got like 100 bucks a day or something like that. So that was like really cool because I got a lot more money when I came in. And um, on, a, on a sad note, it was at Iishima range 
that my dad's sister's husband, my uncle, who I, I never met, I never knew, he was in the 67th TAC Fighter Squadron, and he they were flying uh, F-100s, the Hun, and he was doing a curvilinear pass to be able to uh, drop a bomb. I don't know if it was for nuke training or whatever it was. Unfortunately, there was a descending sloping ceiling, and as he was making the turn, he was following the ceiling, and he went into the water, and it killed him. And so uh, it was interesting that here, you know, many, many, many years later, I'm at the same range that I lost my uncle. So anyway, uh, let's see, what else have we got? Uh, uh, let's see, top, top K, top K-E-K. -E I'm your interview talking about F-15, okay. Uh, you talk about F-4s and how you expect F-4 air-to-air -air pilots who really knew stuff. Can you elaborate? Okay, when we were uh, at Kadena, uh, the F-16s in both Masao and Kunsan were A models. Uh, so the F-4 was still very, uh, very prominent aircraft out there. And the boys at um, Tegu, T-G-U, at Tegu, they, it was one squadron at Tegu, uh, they were the, uh, they didn't have wing tanks. They had the fast, uh, tank, the Mac air tank that we carried on the F-15s. They carried on the F-4. So they could go to seven, gosh, I think it was seven and a half G's is what the F-4 could do. But the, all they did was air to air. So I remember in a Coke Thunder, uh, turning against one of these F-4s and you knew they were cause they were already painted the same gray as ours where all the other F-4s were painted in the, uh, uh, European uh, camo scheme, the lizard paint job. So you, you knew it was an air-to-air -air guy. Uh, and I remember turning over what's called High Peak, and this is the tallest uh, mountain thing that was in the Philippines. And as I'm turning and we're going up, all of a sudden we are canopy to canopy doing this gigantic rolling scissors, vertical rolling scissors. I mean, we were like, dude, I can read this guy's lineup card on his, uh, I mean, looking across the canopy. And he stayed with me the whole time. And it was really, I mean, it was a battle to try and get to where we could shoot each other. Because he's carrying the same weapons system I'm carrying, uh, except I've got a jet that's uh, technologically superior because it's just built later. And, uh, but it was really cool to get to fight this guy and um, have to really work out. And I thought his call sign was Chewy. I think it was because I met him later. And uh, we, we ended up drinking lots of bourbon together, and it was a great time. So an F-4 in the hands of a, an air-to-air -air guy is a great jet. A great jet. Um, says here I've got uh, Ferron Tilly. Part one. <laughs> the F-15, 104 kills, the most people think is BS. Well, it depends on who you talk to, and the Israelis have got a whole lot of kills, and they have not lost an F-15. In the Bekaa Valley War, I think it was, I'm going to say 90, 93, if my memory serves me, to nothing kill ratio. We got to talk to the Israeli guys that were part of that Bekaa Valley War. It's, uh, I may want to disagree with you, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, a kill's a kill. Win's a win. No kidding. By the way, in an air-to-air -air engagement, there are no points for second place because you're dead. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, uh, Lola, sad, tragic, uh, sad to hear. Let's see. Uh, give it a rest, dudes. Again, 104. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I think I'm at the bottom of the list. Is there anybody I have missed? Oh, great one that runs this thing from the air crew interview. Oh, great one. Where are you? Is there anybody I missed at question two? Here it is. Interesting. Uh, something Molnar. B-A-L-A. -A. I think I've got a good one for you here, Gary. Great. Um, I love if a good you, one. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here. Uh, did you, uh, this is from um, Sim Sel, uh, Sedlow. Uh, yeah. Do you practice uh, for air to air, air to ground, uh, air to sea model, air eagle? Um, um, model eagle. Uh, I figured that the upward tilt of the gun would kind of suck for strafing. 
dude, that is a great observation. Yes, that was one of the issues that we talked about when we had to start dropping bombs. That that is a great because the gun is tilted up, and um, it makes a difference. I mean, I know it's, they say it's only two and a half degrees, but I'm telling you, when you're getting low to the ground and you got to point your nose closer to the ground, point more at the ground, it makes a it makes an issue when you're trying to do strafing runs. It is it is a it is an issue. There's no doubt about it. Now everybody, like everything else, uh, whatever the limitations are of your jet, you you work around it. You just do. You just figure out a way to make it work. Uh, it just that's just what you do. So, but you have to recognize it and deal with it and take the appropriate action, as they say. Um, let's see who else. We got some more questions here. Uh, let's see. I got to find me a good question here. Um, hi, Gary. You've been great. That's awesome. Humbly, that's very good. So, thank you very much. I, I like that question. Um, our statement of fact. Yes. Thank you very much. Because I'm told I'm very good at my humility. Um, let's see. What else have we got here? Uh, let's see. Uh, thanks for answering. You also spoke about fighting the Dutch F-16s. Okay. The When I was in Europe, it was only the OB-10s. So all we did was control F-16s. Uh, who else did we control? One, we controlled Canadian 104s all sorts of airplanes. Uh, so I never got to do any air to air engagement whatsoever when I was in Western Europe, when the wall was still up uh, and the fence was, but um, boy, I can only imagine how much fun it must be to go against those F-16s. Ooh, -wee. I would like to do that. Chili Billy, I love it. What aircraft did you have the least trouble with in a DACT fight flying the Eagle? Great question. Hmm. Hmm. I don't. Each one of them had had their advantages. They every aircraft did. I never got to really do any real DACT with a 104, but I would think that would have been the easiest. Uh, we tried to intercept them, but they're just going so fast, so low. Hmm. I can't think of anything because uh, you because uh, they've got armament, and each one of them you you had to respect. Um, probably the guys that have been flying the F-4 air to ground so much that they didn't get any air to air practice. That would probably be the ones I could, you could go against, but, uh, man, you had to honor the threat. That's for sure. Uh, I've got, did the a, uh, I've got a great uh, one here, range. Gary. Sorry. Did the, did you have an angle of attack limit limiter in the Eagle? Nope. Uh, I had, that was what was cool because you, it, that's all you had to do is get slow with anybody because you had no AOA limiter. We could hold the airplane up like this and you'd be doing 90 knots, uh, forward and the airplane could stay level. And then the F-18 shows up and it's doing the same thing, but it could do it at 60 knots or something like that, 70 knots. So my F-15 is going to go out in front of them, which is never a good place to be, um, and I remember I had a, uh, was given a backseat ride to um, a reward to somebody that, that had done something. I can't remember what it was, but he's in the backseat uh, flying what we call the station wagon, um, the two seater. And I remember doing some type of, uh, we're in some type of engagement and I'm trying to get the airplane to come over here to meet him, to, to shoot him. And as the airplane's up here, pure vertical, for some bizarre reason, I look out the side and I see the fuel dump, the fuel coming out of the fuel dump tube going straight up. Okay. Which means I am, I am going downhill. Okay. Cause in order for the fuel to go straight up, straight up like that, uh, that's not good. And I'm thinking, uh, oh. uh, first off, I'm not going to touch the engines because I don't want a compressor stall. If they're turning, that's good. And the airplanes either going to fall forward or it's going to fall behind me. Typically they fall behind you, which is no big deal. Uh, and I remember back in RTU, which is replacement training unit back when they, 
when we first learned the F-15, if you ever in some type of maneuver that the airplane's doing something that you did not uh, purposely design it to do, they said, uh, the saying was, uh, give it to Mac Air and take your Hormel's off of the, uh, the controls. Hormel being the finest quality ham, ham fists. So first thing I did is I took my left hand off of the throttles and I put it up on the canopy handle that sits right up here. And I took my hand and I just sent it around the stick, not grabbing the stick, not grabbing the stick, but around it like that to keep it from flopping around like this. And then I just waited. And sure enough, the airplane pitched over like this. Of course, it's right into a negative G type move as it went past here. And so that was really good because as that happened, I came out of my seat like this because I had the seat belt and everything loose so I could turn around and check six easier. And so what happened was, as, as the airplane flipped down like this, my, my butt was actually directly over the stick. And so if the positive G had happened, I could have gone in front of the stick or on the stick or whatever it was, and it would have made the aircraft uncontrollable and would have had to have ejected, and the guy in the back seat would have lived and I would not. So as this thing is happening, I actually had to push myself back into the seat while it's, while it's at that negative uh, G loading. And I literally pushed myself back in the seat. And when I got the positive G back on the airplane, boom, I sat back down and life was good. So, um, so much for AOA limiting. So anyway, I had that going for me, which is nice. Um, let's see. Sim said low. Do you guys have any exchanges with other air forces? Yes, those guys are what you call them, the golden boys. They get to go with get to go with uh, other uh, services and uh, other countries. And man, I would love to do that. That would have been cool. Um, that's it. Yes, uh, Wimbology uh, TM uh, asked about AIM seven Fs. Oh, never mind. He's never trained with them. Disregard. Uh, Razor 90 knots. Woohoo! Boy, you bet it was until the F 18 came around. Um, let's see, whatever. Uh, if you can share, did you ever train with the Red Eagles out of Tonopah? No, all of my, other than the training flights that I had out of uh, Tyndale Air Force Base in the Panhandle of Florida, uh, that's the only place I ever flew Eagle stateside. All my other Eagle flights were uh, overseas in the Pacific. Uh, question uh, from uh, Farron Tilly. Question on the F-15s using APG 70s. What's the maximum range you feel that the like 120C, 120C for example? Um, I don't remember. I am. I apologize. I just. Uh, I'm getting too old. <laughs> um, we could, I think if I remember correctly, uh, I don't know if we did fly with 70s or 69s, APG 69s. We could easily see out there. We could easily see everything out there. Um, God, I just don't remember. Wow. Uh, uh, Santiago uh, Gerardo, if I pronounce that, 90 knots, exclamation point. You can intercept a Cessna. Uh, let's see, Mr. Anros guy, why was his uh, belt straps loose? The reason why I loose is so I could turn my hips in the seat and I could easily check six. So I'd, you'd actually slide yourself forward and then you turn your hips and be able to turn around to make it so you could, you could see more than just directly behind. You could actually see, you could actually see further than behind you. And so that's why uh, a lot of us loosened our straps. So it's just a risk you take. You know, if you have to eject, it's not going to be good. Uh, you try and tighten up your straps before you eject. But it was just a, you know, most of us said, eh, I'd rather win the fight than anything else. So it's a risk you took. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Just got here. Dude, awesome. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, awesome AOA story. <laughs> I love it. Uh what was it like to Samuel uh, Nush, Shah, uh, 
I don't know. N U C H I A. Apologize. What was it like transitioning between the two? What we did, which worked out really well, is after I was done flying the OB-10, I went back to Holloman Air Force Base, which is in New Mexico, uh, Alamogordo, which is called Alamogordo, but Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, and you would go back to the 38, the T-38, only it was an AT-38. And that's where you would learn air to air. The reason why they picked that is because all of us at the time that flew fighters had flown the T-38. So it was a familiar cockpit, even though it was three years later, it still was familiar. And uh, it allowed for an instructor pilot to be in the back. So if you up front, you did something stupid, they could fix it. Uh, I remember that uh, I was going through, uh, we're going through fighter lead in, BFM training, basic fighter maneuvers. And I'm, I'm trying to learn defensive BFM. And I remember that uh, I would do the, we'd do the rise. You got like five rides in defensive BFM. And then you took a check ride and I busted the check ride because I didn't understand defensive BFM. And um, so obviously I was pretty down when I got done with the ride. <clears throat> and uh, the ops officer for the squadron looked at me and says, what the heck's going on, Goff? And I told him what happened. He says, okay, who's your IP? And he says, oh, God, what the heck is he doing teaching BFM? He just needs to teach air to ground. And he got furious. And I was like, oh, God, I'm in trouble. And he was furious at the scheduler. And so he uh, goes in there and he redoes the schedule for me and he puts a, an air to air F4 guy in my back seat. He was actually a, a former flying fiend, which was the F-4 alert squadron at Osan Air Base uh, before flying F-4s, air-to-air air F-4s, before the F-15s came and took over their defense alert from, uh, from Osan, which I, I mean, from Kadena, which I got to do. So he's a flying fiend, so he knew a whole lot about air-to-air. Air. So he's in my backseat. And we do the turn, he sets up the turn, this is me out in front, and this is the offender, and and he goes, okay, fight's on. So I defeat the, the initial threat. And then the guy does uh, maneuver and I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm looking and I'm trying to pull, I'm trying to pull. And I go, okay, I'm blind, which is the word means you lost sight. And I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I can't see him, I can't see him. And the guy in the back's going, what are you doing, Goff? And I go, I can't see him, I can't see him. I'm pulling for everything I got. And the airplane's just, uh, I don't see him. And he goes, you dumb, blah, 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 as you can well imagine. Uh, look out the other window. I'm flying a jet with a canopy, with a canopy, canopy, canopy. And I'm pulling, I'm pulling, and I'm thinking, what window? And I actually say that, what other window? And then he says a bunch of things about my mother and everything else you can imagine. Look out the other side, blah, 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 blah. And as I'm pulling, I go like this, and I turn around and look. And there, right there, is the other airplane sitting right there. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. I pull the idle, you know that maneuver they did in Top Gun where he pulls, he brings them in close, pulls the idle, goes bell rolls over them. Dude, that's basic. So I pull the idle, roll back over and gun them, and from then on, I could beat anybody when I was defensive. Awesome. Well, <laughs> Gary, we're like what? we're gonna wrap up this Q and A, but yes, like sir. I've got there's one great question from one of our uh, viewers here. And I think this will like you know like wrap up the interview or the Q and A very what? well. Um, it's from Baba K K Z uh, Abika. Uh, can you tell us about your last flight with the Eagle? Dude, that is so cool. Your finny flights are awesome. Okay, the greatest thing that I really enjoyed flying the F fifteen. One of the greatest things for me was air to air refueling. And that the reason why is because after my dad uh, finished up flying the B-47 bomber, he went to the KC-135 and he was a tanker pilot. And his Vietnam tours out of Thailand, or he was a refueler. And so for me, looking up to the boom and getting gas and refueling was a, a, a salute to my father. And so uh, my Finney flight, I, I said, if there's any way we can do this, I really, really, really want to do uh, air refueling. 
And the nice thing at Kadena is that there are always air refueling going on because the Strategic Air Command at the time had uh, KC-135s, tankers there, and they were always doing refueling missions. And so we go out and we do a bunch of uh, dog fighting, and uh, it was uh, 4v me. We had no idea how many how many uh, enemy was going to come on. And then, so then we would do post strike. We go in and hit refueling, and then we go back out again and go and go uh, fight again. And got to do all sorts of uh, BFM stuff, all sorts of great stuff, all the way up to fifty thousand feet, all the way down to the to the to the water and uh and then i made sure that go supersonic because i had to go above the mock for something because i knew i would never ever get to go above the mock and um i i tell you right now and then we came up initial and all i wanted to be as a wingman i i just want i just wanted to sit on the wing because i'll never get to fly formation again and just being able to park yourself on the wing and just and, and just fly uh and so we did we did a bunch of stuff and uh we pitched out come around to land and there was a, a low approach went back up and, and joined up with leads I, so i could do a formation landing we did a formation takeoff and a formation landing because i'm never going to get ever to get to do that again so it was one of those flights where you got to do everything you ever wanted to do in the jet because you knew you'd never get to do it again and we landed, and then what they do is they pop a short uh, champagne bottle, and you get soaked in the champagne. And that was that's a great memory for me. Great memory. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you very much. Absolutely, a great question to end this uh, live Q and A. But uh, yeah, so Gary, thank you very much for coming on the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, I loved it. That was fun. It was fun, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. You as humble as I am it's it's great being humble so yeah everybody should be laughing you do know I'm not serious about that I hope oh yeah yeah I think <laughs> every, like our viewers are great but uh yeah I want to say thank you very much for our viewers uh, like and all the guys who like guys and girls who like uh commented in the you know the section on uh, the side there but uh thank you very much for your questions Gary a p absolute pleasure and Wonderful. you're always like you you're a great bloke and uh, you're always fun. So I'm sure we can do this again in the future. I hope so. What a fun and thank you for all the questions. I loved it. Thank you so much. That was, you guys are pretty smart out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some smart guys out there, isn't there? Oh, there's, there's, they know stuff. <laughs> oh, they know stuff. So again, thank you guys uh, for coming in the uh, in the comments and uh, thank you, Gary. It's, it's been you. an absolute pleasure. All right. Ciao.